learn to have fun sometimes. Not just in studying, no? You have to learn how to have fun in studying. You also need to learn how to take a break and have fun. So you find a group of friends that has that balance also. Hi everybody, I am Brox Leon and this is episode 12 of A Curious Sky After. This episode is a conversation with Charleston Ambatali. I've known Charleston way back in undergrad when we were students taking up electronics and communications engineering at UP Biliman. In this episode, Charleston and I had a chat about life at Triple EI, starting as undergraduate students to now being on the other side of the table as faculty members. Without further ado, let's get started with this episode. Hi, Charleston. Welcome to A Curious Character. Hello. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Um, why don't we start with... So I asked you about... Uh, I asked you to appear in the podcast to talk about our life as instructors and students in Electrical and Electronics Engineering Institute, Triple EI. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to start with um, your motivations for getting into the field of engineering. Uh, why did you study engineering in the first place? Well, let's start with probably how I was brought up. My my parents are both medical doctors, physicians. And uh, growing up, I actually wanted to be a medical doctor. But uh, during high school, I realized that biology is very difficult. And I didn't like it. just loved math and physics more. And... Uh, Engineering, specifically electronics and communications engineering, uh, was introduced to me by one of my teachers, and I, I liked the idea of building things. So there, we had we had electives when we were high school, and one of them is microcontrollers. I actually liked uh, fiddling with the microcontrollers and programming it. So I decided, okay, why not give electronics and communications engineering a try? So I put I put that on uh, on all the universities that I applied for. I put ECE as the first choice, and here we are. My main motivation really is just I really want to build and uh, more more on playing with things. When I was a kid, I also played a lot with uh, a lot of toys, tinkered with their electronics just to see if I can build uh, break them and build them again, and so on and so forth maybe that's how it started for me yeah so how did it um what were your expectations going into engineering school and how did triple e lived up to your expectations of how life is going to be like uh i expected engineering school to be uh i'd say fun especially in the laboratory classes but uh the, I, I, uh, the the reports when 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 we're going to make reports during the lab that's not the fun part. Yeah, uh, I, I I like solving problems. So when when it, when it comes to lecture classes, I like to listen and solve problems on my own. That's what I expected from engineering school and the challenge. Of course, I expected it to be challenging based on what people said to me uh, before that engineering is hard. So I expected a challenge and it lived up to my expectations. And I had fun in building and experimenting in the lab. So I'd say that my expectations were met. Aside from the reports, I never liked uh, making reports for yeah. the lab. <laughs> yeah, who, who likes making reports anyway? And when you think about it, most of us go into engineering thinking that if I'm in engineering, I don't have to write a lot of you know, I don't have to be good in English and such, but then yeah. I realize <laughs> you no, have to publish papers. <laughs> you have to publish papers. You need to create a manual for what you're going to make and so on and so forth. Yeah, you still need to write and write. So we won't, <laughs> it won't leave. You yeah. still need to learn how to write. Yeah, and now one thing about, I mean, the first step of getting into a, getting a degree if you're an undergrad is selecting a course. And that's, now that we've established, okay, this is how you uh, selected ECE as an undergrad program, etc. And then when you think about it, uh, when you go into um, 
triple E, you realize there's so many uh, different fields or subfields within um, electrical and electronics engineering. Uh, could, could you tell us a bit about that? Well, uh, to put it broadly, the subfields of electrical and electronics engineering uh, there, there's a lot there's actually a lot there's uh there's power systems communication systems control systems and computers so that's four broadly you can broadly classify them okay uh, communication systems would be for ece uh power systems would be for ee and computers would be for computer engineers and control systems is uh broad broadly encompasses every field so you, there's a bit of a control system in each of the three other fields. So that's how I can broadly classify all four, uh, all uh, the different branches of Triple E. Yeah. Uh, how would you classify? How would you classify? Or if you're already as an undergrad, say if I'm an undergrad, how would I know where I wanted to go? Because there are so many. I mean, they are similar, but they are still different. Right. So, as an undergrad, well, where do we start with uh, classifying them? Maybe if, we can talk about, because um, one part for our students is that they have to select a lab and oh, yeah, okay. an elective. So, we can probably start with that. How do you choose a lab, um, get an elective, etc. All right. So, if you're going to choose a lab, uh, you have to look into the basics first. So the basics are taught in the first two years in the undergrad for all three courses in Triple E: computer engineering, electronics engineering, and electrical engineering. Uh, excuse me. You have to look into the basics. Uh, which subject did you like the best? Right? If you didn't like them all, which subject did you perform well? At the very least, if you didn't like any subject at all. Which is the subject that interests you, even if you did not perform well. If it's your passion, you like that subject, even if you did not perform well, you really liked it, then we look into that first. And look into the labs that uh, have the subject as a prerequisite for them, for, for, for you to apply to them. So, for example, in our laboratory, that would be the Wireless Communications Engineering Laboratory, okay, uh, the prerequisite subjects are. Electromagnetics, that's triple E 23 in the old curriculum and triple E 135 in the new curriculum. And the other prerequisite is triple E, uh, triple E 25, or sorry, triple E 35 rather, signals and systems, which is triple E 147, if I'm not mistaken, in the new curriculum. So if you performed well in one of them or it interests you, uh, one of them interests you, then you should consider applying to the laboratory. If, for example, you're you're interested in applying to, say, the a robotics and automations laboratory or RAL, uh, you have to be interested or you have to be good at control systems. That is triple E one five one in the new curriculum. So that's how, well, that's for me at least. That's how I uh, thought how my thought process. That's my thought process in how to uh, what what lab i chose to apply to so, so what made, what what made you choose wasel as an undergrad so uh, i i chose wasel because i like electromagnetics it was a uh, challenging fun and really uh, heavy in mathematics and in, when it expa when when we uh, when i took the elective uh, microwave engineering and uh, wireless communications i actually liked it more uh it basically triple e 157 uh microwave engineering expanded on uh the last topic of electromagnetics which is a generalization of circuits in high frequencies and uh i love the topic and decided to pursue uh the wireless communication engineering laboratory so that's uh, when it comes to communications, I was first really not interested in it. But when 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 I saw when when I experienced the the complexity, the uh, challenges in uh, in the subjects, I actually liked to uh, I actually liked and liked the challenge and uh, decided to uh, apply there basically. 
Yeah, interestingly. Is that answered so, question? Yes, you did. <laughs> uh, and side note, going off that, um, taking an elective on microwave engineering, because I remember I took the same elective with you and B-Boy back then. Yes. And the opposite yes. actually, just to share, yep. the, the opposite happened to me because I took, the two electives that I took as an undergrad were Introduction to Cellular Networks and that one, the microwave engineering. Yeah. And when you think about it, both are WASEL electives. But I ended up yep. not even applying for the lab. And I guess that this would give yep. um, an idea for students that even though, well, it happens that you, you take something and then you realize you don't like it. And that's when I realized, that, oh, okay, this is not for me. The WASEL lab is not for me. And honestly, back then, I was just applying. I took the elective because I knew I had, I had friends. I had you guys to take it with. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then during our time, we were taking, I think we were taking electives ahead of other people. So it's yeah, just yes, yes, yes. us. And then Rai was already taking up his uh, thesis. Aldre has his own world. Yes. And then the others already, yes. you know, almost are not yet yeah. there. So it's like, okay, let's, let's do that. So I think that's another perspective when choosing um, a laboratory for, for undergrads. Because now I'm not sure if you've been receiving um, emails asking like, how's the process, etc. How do you usually navigate those? Navigate the emails. I mean, you, uh, I, how do you, as an undergrad, how would you navigate? Yeah, uh, lo looking for or deciding what lab you want to apply it because now it's very difficult, no? Because it's yeah. it, it's it's remote, so we can't really just knock on the doors. That's true. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, something that we never experienced. Uh, eight seven years ago <laughs> it's been that long <laughs> it's it's uh how how would you uh, navigate that well uh maybe the same approach on how we look into uh or how we apply to the to doctorate programs now we look at their website or their activities we inquire about that the, the good thing here is that this there are already students in the institute they can easily inquire with their uh, upperclassmen, especially those who are already affiliated with the labs, on what they do in the laboratory. So uh, the application process actually also does that, but when you're already applying, you have tasks that you need to do. It, it's, like, uh, it's like another subject that you need to uh, take when you're applying for a lab, but it's not reflected in your Form 5. Okay? So, uh, to be honest though, I, I, I don't really agree much on the application process, but I feel that it's necessary for the students to undergo because uh, we need to know if they're actually a fit for the lab and there's only a limited number of equipment that they can use. So, if, if, if only we could accept everyone, right? But yeah. no, we don't have, we don't have uh, unlimited budget here. <laughs> and anyway. since you touched yeah, and since you touched on it a little bit, it's kind of similar to when you're applying for PhDs or masters. Um, yeah. Not everyone will end up pursuing graduate studies, but mm -hmm. I feel like even the process of applying for labs or just choosing what specialization you would want to work on would give mm -hmm. these students an idea on which um, in trajectory in the industry they would be going to, okay. you know. Yeah. Yeah, because opportunity-wise, um, you could go into work for a telco, Smart Globe, yes. or go to a semicon company, Maxim, or analog devices yes. and all. Yeah, yeah. and I, I'm curious. Yeah, one thing I'm curious about is why you ended up staying in the university. Oh, that's actually a good question. Uh, when I graduated, when we well, you were with me. We both graduated at the same time. Uh, when we graduated, uh, I I already thought of taking up masters also in UP. I, uh, basically, since we graduated early, uh, earlier, one time earlier, uh, there was an easy transition from uh, bachelor's degree to master's degree if I stayed in UP. That's one. And uh, the main reason why I want to take masters before is not just to expand on my studies, it's also to uh, delay a little bit on decisions. 
I think that's one of, one of the reasons I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do after graduation. Uh, I, I was an intern at a semiconductor company. Uh, I didn't like the environment that much. It was draining and very restrictive. It felt like uh, when, when I was in the office, I can't, uh, if, if I have free time, I can't do anything that I want. I, have, I just have to sit and look like I'm working. I don't know why. Uh, I'm there. I'm just in front of the computer. I already did my work. I'm just lazing around. I can't even browse Facebook or whatnot. It was very boring. It was very restrictive. I never liked it. And every time we enter and leave, they have to check our bags, which is, I, I understand because there was an incident before. We're going to disclose. I think it's public information anyway. Uh, Intel used to be based here in the Philippines. And there were, there were multiple occurrences of theft from the employees. They're taking chips from Intel and taking them home, never giving wow. them back. I don't know if it's true. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. Uh, that, maybe that started it. But uh, the semiconductor companies are that strict. And I understand why they're that strict because they want to prevent theft of uh, company property. But it was, it was very restrictive for me, and I didn't like it. Maybe it's, it's just one company out of uh, a lot of semiconductor companies here in the Philippines. But uh, it was basically uh, when I took my master's, I wanted to delay making decisions. But I also uh, had a lot of opportunity while, while taking master's. I, was, uh, I became a graduate assistant, part of a project in the University of the Philippines, a microsatellite project. I also... Tried to. Uh, I I also became a part-time lecturer in the university, and I actually loved that part, teaching part and doing projects. And uh, because of that, maybe that made me hooked on the academic life. So after I graduated masters, I did not go full-time faculty yet. I I I uh, I, uh, I became part of the microsatellite project full-time for one semester and after one semester I decided to go full time faculty because I it felt it felt like uh, teaching mentoring uh, teaching and mentoring is more uh, it's a better fit for me I believe I, I actually like the job and uh, better than the project so uh, it, it went the other way around basically I became a full time faculty and part time project staff so a consultant basically I didn't do much hands-on work on the project, but I uh, did other other things like uh, uh, I taught subjects that are in line with the project. That's mm -hmm. one, and I went into meetings, uh, gave input, and so on and so forth. So I actually like like what I'm doing. And when 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 uh, when we're uh, teaching in the university. You're basically free to go uh, anywhere, any anytime. Just, just you just need to attend uh, or give lectures. Make sure that the students learn. That's the responsibility that is given, and it's not that restrictive. During my free time, I can work on my uh, own projects or mentor students, help them. Uh, could uh, work on circuit prototypes in my own desk at the office and so on and so forth. And that's what I like about this academic life. It's very stark contrast to what I experienced when I when I was in a semiconductor company, an intern in a semiconductor company. Yeah. So and I feel I feel, I feel like that's the same reason for me why I I mean I've been work I worked for full time office job, but I like that job because it's tech transfer, you get to yes. work closer to health research. But at the same time that aspect of you know being able to do what you want sort of because you know we have administrative duties that we have to uh, comply yes, with yes. and regular um, rules in the university and such but that yeah i feel like that's same for me with regards to why you decided to stay in the university as a faculty and all yes yeah, so i love that um so maybe we can talk a bit about the opportunities in going back to that topic of being in a lab and being in Wasel. So, mm -hmm. um, what projects have you did you get involved with in the past, or the opportunities that you got? If you could reflect a bit on those and how it helped you become, you know, who you are right now. 
So mainly when uh became full time faculty already, uh already uh we all we're already thrust into making project proposals for big projects that uh, applying to DOST for funding and so on and so forth. And uh the projects I've been in, uh, aside from the micro satellite project, is the Picari uh scan project, which is basically uh, measuring the connectivity in the Philippines. So there were three part, three projects under that program. Our project was on spectrum measurement. So we want to check if the spectrum was properly utilized here in the Philippines. And uh, I don't know if I can disclose some information yet here, so I, I won't. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're, we want to publish our results uh, here in the Philippines about that and uh, maybe even push for policy. And that's what I like about that project is because it, is the, it has the potential to influence policy, especially on the spectrum use here in the Philippines. Uh, first and foremost, the, the spectrum use here is, uh, you, maybe a lot of people already know this, the spectrum use here is sparse. There are a lot of dead areas here in the Philippines. I experience it when I go home. There's an area in the mountains where we don't have signal and if we're stuck in traffic there it happens especially during elections if we're stuck in traffic there we can't contact anyone we're just there in our car or an hour in a bus we can't contact anyone we're stuck in traffic it's boring it's also boring all right so uh the spectrum use basically here in the philippines is not the spectrum is not much utilized. And we also have challenges of connecting to different islands because we are an archipelago. Japan is an archipelago also. Why, why do they have good uh, spectrum usage? Well, I, I, I don't know much. I, I believe it's because Japan has very close, uh, the islands are very close to each other. As compared to the Philippines, the islands are not that close to each other. So that's also another challenge that we have here. So mainly uh, what I like on this project is that it has a social impact and it can possibly <clears throat> possibly influence policy. And uh, that's what I like about this project. Uh, some of the other projects I've been, here, I've been in in the past year, especially, is the electronic stethoscope project. So development of, uh, of an electronic stethoscope for, the, uh, for COVID-19 response. And there's also a project where we are uh, fabricating a drone. Uh, was, it, this one is funded by UP. And uh, it gives me experience on aerospace engineering a little bit. So that's what I like about that project particularly. And uh, I think that's all. I'd like, to go, I'd like to go back to the Spectrum project. Yeah. I, I've never heard of this, that before yeah. until now. <laughs> so... That's What's the what's the long term goal of that? So what's the output of your your if I got it correctly, the output is you'll be able to provide um, data that yeah. we should increase the spectrum yes. usage in the country. Is it? Yes, uh, that's that's one. Uh, there are three parts to this project actually. That's our part. That's the wireless spectrum. One part is the wired spectrum. No, no not spectrum. The wired uh, infrastructure. Uh, they're measuring the internet connectivity of our uh, DSL and so on and so forth. So the output of this project basically is a lot of data that is evaluating our uh, our connectivity here in the Philippines, specifically uh, the internet connectivity. So uh, it's not just the data, actually. The hardware that's developed here can be adopted by different agencies to monitor the spectrum usage. So even if there is the data already, the data that we're going to use the data to, to craft a policy paper to push for policy, but the hardware, we expect it to be used by uh, different agencies, as uh, example, the NPC, to monitor if the spectrum is actually used properly by the people they give their license to. Mm -hmm. okay. Basically, policing. So, uh, if I, if, as far as I know, they don't have the right equipment to even pinpoint 
were the source of the uh, source of uh, what what they call the source of the colorum transmission. They don't even have the uh, equipment to pinpoint where that is. And uh, there are a lot of people who are just transmitting over the air and are not licensed at all. Wow. There's a lot. Yeah. I experienced this firsthand on amateur radio bands. For amateur radio transmission, you need a license to transmit. And there are a lot of people that I hear over the radio that they're not even practicing amateur radio etiquette. So part of that etiquette is uh, not hugging the frequency spectrum because it's it's a scarce. So we want fair use for everyone. Okay. So a lot of them are not even correctly using the spectrum. So even if they have a license, so even if they have a license, if they don't use it properly, they still need to be policed. And uh, the hardware developed in this project can be used for that purpose. We expect it at least. So we have we still have we still have yet to talk to the agencies about it. Will you be involved even if even when you go to Japan for PhD? Uh, I won't be involved anymore. Uh, the, the project is coming to a close. We just met last week uh, about it. Uh, it was stalled because of the pandemic and because of the slow processing of the funding agency. I won't disclose who's the funding agency. <laughs> As usual. <laughs> it, we, we actually, um, the, the year two funding was not released for an entire year. We were not able to move anything. Uh, 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 we're just relying on the data that we have right now. Uh, the year two funding was just released. We're applying for an extension and so on. You know the story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and actually, I found it interesting how... So you mentioned the three main projects that you, you've been yeah. working on um, in the past year. And it just goes to show the breadth of engineering that yes. a student or... Um, a professional could be involved with because like the first one is very communications or very wasal as they say and then the next yeah. one is e-stethoscope e-steth- e-steth- is very biomed yes. yes. and you see the application of ECE specifically diba? yes and the other one would be satellite so no question there satellite is a product um, of many uh, many engineering fields and electronics, computer and even electrical engineering is uh, part of it, basically. So yeah. we call satellites the king of systems, and that's true. And how how well how has everything been affected by the pandemic? Teaching, research, etc. Let's talk about your remote teaching experience. Probably last. Will it be the last? Uh, semester, young first semester, right? Maybe uh, a little bit of this semester. I still have to. Uh, I still have subjects for this semester. Uh, okay. So, how did remote teaching affect me? Well, it, it's actually very difficult. A lot of the work has been passed to us, especially in not just uh, preparing material. Uh, some of it is even sourcing equipment for the students. So it's very difficult. Uh, but in terms of teaching only and purely teaching, uh, the remote semester, I think I adjusted well because uh, before, during the start of the pandemic, actually, uh, I, I uh, tried to enroll and audit courses at Coursera and I adopt, adapted, ad- adopted, sorry, I adopted the style of giving materials, giving quizzes, and everything is asynchronous. So... I believe that if we're going to teach remotely, we have to be more flexible in time. So we, I did not give strict deadlines to the students. And I suggested that we just use quizzes to evaluate them, mostly quizzes, but not, not uh, for, for my two subjects, I still included some problem sets because they have a laboratory part and so on and so forth. And so forth. But for the purely, purely lecture subject that I handled last semester, we only gave quizzes. And there has been largely positive, a positive feedback on that because uh, it gives flexibility to students. So the downside here is that they won't, they won't be able to discuss the answers with them. So if the, the deadlines are flexible, we shouldn't 
give out the answers to anyone at all. So that's the hard part. How, how do we know? Uh, how, how will we... Uh, how will we basically let them realize where they are wrong in the quizzes if we won't be able to discuss it with them? So that's one part of uh, teaching difficulty here in remote learning and so on and so forth. Would you still um, do that approach this upcoming semester? Uh, I, still, I, I think there, there needs to be some adjustments. Uh, I want to be able to discuss the quizzes to the student at some point. So I'm still exploring how to do that. Maybe uh, I'll give an incentive to those who finished on time and those who are finishing late. Won't, uh, uh, I won't give a penalty. That's, I don't think that's fair. So maybe they, they won't get, get an incentive. Uh, I'll still be able to discuss it. So uh, if I discuss it, they uh, they'll get a perfect score maybe, and that's fine. Still exploring the options, it's not yet final. Yeah, it's, so it's very challenging. Hopefully. One thing that I tried, I think for last semester, what I tried was, uh, yeah, give an in incentive for students who would submit on time, no penalties for those who are, are not able to do so. But it's not super effective in my experience, at least for, oh. for, the what, for one class that I handled. Um, I don't know if yeah. it's because that class is mostly graduating students, so they just wanted to graduate. Uh, yeah. Pro possibly. For, for yeah. one class that I did, there was an incentive for submitting quizzes early, and they, they submitted, most of them submitted it early because, maybe because that is one aspect of the subject that they could control, whereas per se, lab, lab reports or the long exams are beyond their control. So they were banking on the incentive that they would get from the quizzes. So it's very different. Yeah, I think I understand. <laughs> any tips? Difficult. Yeah, any tips for students who are going through remote learning and like having, you know, struggling, triple, doing triple E or studying triple E in the pandemic? Oh, that's difficult because I never experienced it. So uh, different students have different in, uh, different things that impede them on properly learning uh, remotely. So what are the tips? Hmm. Or what worked, may, uh, maybe I'll rephrase it to what worked for you um, as you cope through, you know, remote teaching and even studying, you know, for your exams uh, yeah I, I studied uh just to give you context i i, I did study uh before uh, the entrance exam that i had in august so i studied remotely uh using coursera or youtube and whatnot and okay maybe i can give tips from there so uh the tip here is that uh if you have all the materials already at your possession you just need to study and scrutinize them. Uh, you have sample prob you find sample problems and uh, try to solve them. If you can't solve them, you go back to the lessons. And uh, after trying to solve them, maybe even simulate them to see if your theory uh, actually what is what happens in simulation. And that's what I did when I studied. So uh, an example of that would be uh, I studied control systems. I reviewed them again for the exam. This aerospace engineering. There's a lot of control systems there. Uh, I studied them again, control systems, and uh, speci uh, specifically, I studied the state space. This, this was not taught to us during our undergrad. I think you're, you you taught one five one last semester. You you taught state space. Did you review it? I I believe it, it was never taught to us in Tripoli one hundred one before. Um, I think it was touched for a bit, but I can't really remember. It's been so long because we were taught. I think, I, I, I think yeah. we were taught state space in Tripoli Twenty One. Was it? I'm not Tripoli, sure. No, no, that's different. Actually, that's different. no. It's a I different type of. Uh, yes, the state space is very different. It's it it it, it has a lot of linear algebra actually. Yeah. So you're dealing with matrices and so on and so forth. It's especially good for big systems. 
with multiple inputs and multiple outputs. So that's your satellite, basically. Okay, so state space, I reviewed that or actually learned that during the pandemic. I was never taught, we were never taught that. In, at least in my Tripoli 101 class, you took Tripoli 101 earlier than me, though. Right, if I remember yeah. correctly. <laughs> So it was never taught to us, and uh, I solved some problems in the book and uh, in the samplex of the uh, exams, the sample exam that was given to me, and I simulated it using MATLAB. So I have a student version of MATLAB, and uh, I simulated the system. I, I had to check if my theory was correct, and does it work in simulation? And at first, I, re I was really doubting how state space would work. This, this, Maybe this wouldn't work. I, I thought this wouldn't work, but when I, I simulated it, wow, it works. So I was really surprised, and I was uh, happy when I, when when I when I saw that theory. Uh, what I solved is actually what happened in simulation, and that gave me a boost of confidence when I was studying. So, so I think that's a uh, that's my tip for the uh, students is that what they study, they try to simulate. So, uh, I'm I'm trying to set up the courses with that also in mind. So there would be a theory part, and there is a part where they should simulate. And uh, from simulation, even if they don't have an actual hardware, in simulation, if they're able to make it work, they'll be more confident on what they've learned. So I think theory is just not just doesn't cut it for me that much. If I learn the theory, maybe uh, a little bit of doubt, right? Until I've seen it in action. So. Uh, an exception to this would be electromagnetics, though. So I've learned the theory. I've never seen. Uh, I haven't seen it much being uh, applied. We don't have a laboratory course for that, but I believe that it works because it's the basis of or the foundation of our field, basically. So we observe it during the lab, but not directly, and so on and so forth. Anyway, so for if you're if you have doubts with the theory, if you're not confident enough with what you've learned, you try to simulate it. You have the tools, so I think for UP students, Tripoli students, you have the tools, software at least. You have a campus-wide license; you can utilize that for MATLAB and simulate what you need to simulate. So that's that's my tip. You're not meant to be a mathematician or a theoretical computer scientist. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. There's a big. Uh, you're not meant to be a mathematician, so uh, you can you can get practically close what you want to achieve but maybe you won't achieve it at all and that's okay that's part of engineering there's an error margin that we call it so yeah that's true and that's one one good thing about i mean i think that's one pro of going into engineering it's very practical <laughs> yes i agree so uh, yeah I've, I've seen students also that are uh, good at very good at mathematics and uh they have a hard time approximating so I also had that hard time. So when, when we assume that this is very small, we can say that these other terms are negligible and so on and so forth. They have a hard time unifying that because of the math training that they have. They must have been uh, students who are competing in international math competitions as far as we know. So where a lot of things are exact. But when we are talking about engineering, uh, a lot of it is approximation to a practical extent. So. If you approximate this, you see a certain behavior that matches uh, your theory and your simulation and so on and so forth. So if you have doubts with the approximation, why not simulate it? That's what I do also. So there, there was a problem in the aerospace entrance exam where you have, uh, I don't know how to draw it here. <laughs> can, Describe uh, it. So you have a ball, okay, and two strings that are attached to it. I two, uh, sorry, two springs, okay. The springs are attached to a ceiling and the floor, and if you move the ball a little bit, it should oscillate. Okay. okay. If the initial displacement is very large, it will oscillate chaotically, very not random, uh, chaotic. So the pattern would be very hard to find. But if you, uh. If you displace it small, small enough, you will see a sinusoidal oscillation. So at first I doubted that, but when I simulated it, it is sinusoidal. So 
so that's an example of maybe if if you're doubting the approximations, why not try to simulate it? So simulate it with the whole system in mind, even if it's non-linear or so, and then use a small input. You have the uh, the satisfy the conditions where it's very small, and then you will see that your uh, the theory matches the practical output of the simulation. And that's what's good about engineering. It's very practical, basically. And uh, if you have a hard, if you have, if, if you're struggling to uh, unify your uh, math prowess, maybe to engineering, and that's fine. Okay. So it uh, it just takes a lot of experience, I believe, to be able to unify them. So if you come from a purely mathematical standpoint, well, uh, it. Uh, it takes some time to adjust to the approximations and practicality of engineering, at least in my opinion, basically. Yeah, and we do a lot of those mathematical modeling for our circuits. Yeah. You know, the first time that you build an RC circuit, you you yes. you approximate how it will behave um, yes. in steady state and transient. So that's that's why we're doing all those <laughs> things and studying math fifty three, fifty four, one one four is for steady for state state space. The matrices, yes. right? The matrices, yes. So, uh, how do we uh, unify this? We, for for the circuit, even even the circuit approximation is just an approximation, and in the first place, if you're going to learn electromagnetics, which is very mathematical, right? If you're gonna learn electromagnetics, you will learn that the circuits are just an approximation. Mm -hmm. So. Even when you're you have started uh, studying circuits, you're already approximating. So practically, this is how the circuit behaves, right? When you apply it in the lab, there will be errors with the theory, right? And uh, that that should be fine, right? As long as you are within the margin of error, you are uh, you are targeting, right? So as you go deeper and you go in the higher level in engineering, you will have more of these approximations actually and you will tend to uh, largely deviate from your ideal from the ideal uh, ideal circuit to your practical circuit and so on and so forth it becomes more difficult to actually design yeah so and that's actually the fun part <laughs> it is and and as a in, in addition to that to the students if it's getting difficult to visualize or imagine how these things work. It, I think it always helps to seek your, I mean, study with friends or find yes. someone who can help you um, put things into your own words because sometimes the teachers would explain it differently on how they understood it. But I don't know, for some reason, if, you, if your classmate and um, teaches is, or if your classmate discuss it with you later on, they pretty much said the same thing, but you understood it better. I, I for sure experienced that as an undergrad, which is weird. Good. That's true. That's, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good tip, actually. Uh, you have to uh, find friends, study with them a lot. So uh, lock, yourself up in, lock, lock yourselves up in the library or something. Well, not, not possible now, but that's what we did before. I remember Tripoli 23, or uh, answering problems at 3. Uh, we had we we locked ourselves in engineering library two for six hours or so just to discuss the problems uh, at three. Uh, it was draining, but it helped us learn actually a lot trying to solve the problems. So yeah, yeah. for sure. Find friends. Sure. Find friends. And now pandemic, I mean yeah. I think everyone at least have free data or whatsoever um, could try to utilize that. Especially for, I could imagine how difficult it is for freshies um, to be starting college in a pandemic. Like you're still in the process of getting to know people. So I would strongly recommend, well, we were in the same organization as an undergrad and definitely many yeah. of my good friends from Triple E are people in those um, org, in that org. So strongly yeah. recommend joining because they will be our support system, right? Yeah, I strongly support joining an academic org. There's a lot in Triple E. Uh, there's uh, UP Circuit, UP Erg, uh, the I Triple E student chapter newly established, mm -hmm. and your uh, course. ICEP. 
Yeah, yeah course, the course specific. Course. But for computer engineering, there's still I don't think there's still a, there's a course specific org yet. I think they tried to establish one, but it didn't gain momentum. So okay. maybe interesting. But they, yeah. computer engineering students can still uh, go to UP Circuit Org or IEEE yeah. student chapter. Yeah, for sure. And it, I think it's up. I think it's application season now again. Can you believe it's yeah. been almost ten years <laughs> since yeah. we applied for an org? Oh my gosh! Yes, <laughs> yes. almost ten years. I remember. And I think I applied first year, first semester. So it's yeah, it's almost ten years. Almost. Why did you Why did you apply right away? Why Why did you apply <laughs> first year and first sem? I, I I maybe I I forgot the thought process that I had before. Maybe it's because I I uh, I think first year first time the load was light, so I I have more bandwidth to uh, apply to organizations. Yeah, and think, why did you why maybe. did you decide this is not this episode is not meant to be a UP Circuit um, advertisement? But why did you apply for for UP Circuit yeah, back it's then? Uh, hmm, UP Circuit. Why UP Circuit? I'm actually yeah. wearing a Circuit shirt. Oh, <laughs> UP Shirt. <laughs> anyway, uh, why, why did I apply to UP Circuit? Uh, I'm trying to remember the reason. I think it's uh, the basketball players. A lot of them are from Circuit, from the varsity team. I met them. Next is the blockmates. So I think most of them Miko, expressed interest in applying. Miko and Aldre yes, was applying apply. the same semester as you. Yes, I think actually even the when I asked around, I think they they are thinking more, leaning more into uh, UP Circuit. Okay, I I, I try to apply immediately to UP Circuit. Yeah, I it was it, yeah it was it was the same reason for me because many of our blockmates and friends mm-hmm. were applying, so I also applied, but. Um, it doesn't matter which org you end up applying to. Yeah. What's important is you find yeah. a community that you feel you like. You feel like you belong. So yeah. Even, yeah, if you find a community, even if you don't have an organization, that's fine. That's fine. So a lot of yeah, people but, survive without orgs, right? I mean, yeah, I know yeah. a lot of people. Adrian Vidal, our suma yeah. humada in our batch, <laughs> doesn't have an org. No, yeah, I think he's a member of an org outside the Tripoli. Right? Computer organization. I forgot the name. Well, Adele, Adele doesn't have an org also. <laughs> he has a circuit shirt. So Adele yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right? <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's, not, it's not important, but if, if it's an easy way to have a community, at the least. Right. It's a yeah. surefire way to have a community. But there are other ways. So, my, my group of friends... Uh, a lot of them don't have an organization, actually. So we also have that uh, group here in, in Triple E. Not the, uh, I'm the only one from UP Circuit there. Yeah, and um, a friend of mine there is from UP Erg. So we have this own group. They don't have, uh, most of them don't have orgs, but we uh, sometimes we also study together. So we find a community, basically, for yeah. you to... Not just study, of course. You hang out with them, go out with them. But again, this is the pandemic, so it makes it... Uh, <laughs> yeah, extra <laughs> difficult. <miss> going out. <laughs> <laughs> well, two questions that I ask everyone that I invite in the show to wrap up this conversation is... Yeah. First would be, what's next for what's you? Next? Uh, for me, uh, to, to advance my career, I believe that would be doctoral. So to uh, pursue a PhD, I think that's what's next for me. I, and uh, for a long term, after that would be to maybe establish aerospace engineering in UP, I, or uh, continuing with communications and uh, high frequency engineering and uh, proposing projects to DOST concerning satellites also. So uh, I, I want to pursue. Well, uh, the uh, synthetic aperture radar, specifically for satellites. So it's a high-frequency device that uses uh, 
uh, read uh, around uh, around nine up to nine to ten gigahertz of frequency and uh, to image basically the earth so it doesn't have a problem against clouds so unlike light if you're trying to take a picture with clouds they're there but for up synthetic aperture radar the clouds will be transparent so it's a good way to image the philippines which, which is always cloudy so that's one and uh hopefully when i come back we can uh propose something like that so we're going to have a synthetic aperture radar on a satellite so that we can image the Philippines, our own satellite that has synthetic aperture radar. That's a long-term goal, basically. Okay. I think it aligns and, with the uh, Philippine... It aligns with the Philippine Space Agency also. Space Agency. Yes. Yes, that's that's what I want for a long term. Short term is basically I just need to pursue a PhD. So I won't think about the long-term goal that much for now. What are so you what specializing? Next. What will be your specialization for PhD? Uh, that uh, specialization is, it's a course in aeronautics and aerospace engineering. So, uh, sorry, aeronautics and astronautics. The formal name in the University of Tokyo is uh, aeronautics and astronautics. So, it also concerns airplanes, but... Uh, I expect my uh, specialization to be more inclined to satellites. So very, di- they're actually very different if you think about it. Mm-hmm. So satellites operate in a vacuum condition. Airplanes operate in a very windy condition. You know, I studied it. It's very difficult. <laughs> anyway, so that's that's uh, that's my specialization. Nice. Last question would be three pieces of advice that you would give to students or young professionals who would like to succeed or survive triple E? Oh, okay. So, uh, three pieces of advice. So, I think we've already discussed it, but just to summarize. So, number one, to be fi- to find the right people, find right uh, friends to survive the, the mentally draining uh course that's engineering engineering in general actually so find the right people that's one two uh, try to simulate everything that you learn so if you have the means to simulate it try to simulate it so you'll have a deeper understanding of the topic and uh, you have more confidence in uh, in the concepts and the theory uh, another piece of advice would be uh Learn to have fun sometimes. Not just in studying, no. You have to learn how to have fun in studying. You also need to learn how to take a break and have fun. So you find a group of friends that has that balance also. So have fun also. So it should be an enjoyable part of your life. Yeah, I think so. It should be an enjoyable part of your life. So don't focus much that much on the studies. Also focus on uh, giving yourself a mental health break, having fun, and so on and so forth. That's what I give to the students right now. To the, awesome. Uh, advice. Yeah. Great, great advice. Last one is, that that last one is spot on, be human. So, yeah, be human. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Before I end the recording, <laughs> um, if you're, uh, where could people learn more about your work or how can they get in touch with you or something? Uh, you can just uh, send an email to me. And, uh, it's, they can find me actually in the Tripoli The website? Uh, page. Yes, Tripoli website and the engineering, College of Engineering website any, anyway. And uh, I think they can find my Google Scholar also. So my email is there. It's verified. So you can send an email there. So it's cmambatali at up.edu.ph. All so right. So they can send a message there. Or even in Messenger, they find me. Sometimes <laughs> I answer. Sometimes, sometimes no, I answer, sometimes I don't. But Don't use uh, Messenger. I prefer, <laughs> yeah, I prefer email. Messenger is more personal. More personal. More, more personal. Yeah. So, email. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your time and best of luck with the PhD 
upcoming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Bye. Bye. That is it for this chat. If you like this episode or would like to suggest a future topic, let me know by sending me a quick message. I'm always looking for interesting conversations and hope to share more similar stories in the future. My Twitter handle is at rocksalt, that's R-O-X-S-A-L-T. You may also send me an email at rocksalt.acc at gmail.com. Thanks for tuning in and see you in the next one.